God has called you as his chosen one through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he's elevated you, exalted you in Jesus to reign in this life and in the life to come. However, many of God's children are being destroyed bit by bit by the devil through the deception and the distractions of this world. In this video, I'll be sharing some of the ways the enemy uses to destroy God's chosen ones. I pray that God will use this message to bring deliverance into your life, as his word has said that he sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Psalms 107, 20. God's word in this video will bring you healing and deliverance as your eyes will be opened and you'll receive the grace to break free from everything the enemy's been secretly using to weaken and keep you defeated. Who are God's chosen ones? Simply put, God's chosen one is anyone who's received the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ. This is anyone who's accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, accepted the life of Christ, and has made the decision to forsake the old way of living. The Bible describes God's chosen people in Revelation 5.9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. God's chosen one is that person who's experienced the greatest miracle ever, the miracle that turns a sinner into a saint, that turns God's enemy into a citizen of his kingdom. Jesus said that many are called, but only a few are chosen. Everyone on earth is called to salvation. This means that the door to salvation is open to every individual on the earth today. There is no segregation. There is a place for every lost soul in God's kingdom. However, it's sad that many won't answer that call. Many won't accept him. Only those who answer this call and turn to the Lord, turning from their old ways, accepting his saving grace, and walking into the light of his word are his chosen ones. As long as you, a chosen one, are on earth, as much as you are the light of the world and the blessed of the Lord, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, you will also be a target of Satan's attacks. The greatest enemy of God's chosen ones is the devil, and he has one desire, to destroy God's children. The Bible therefore warns us not to be ignorant about this and to always be on our guard, because he's always trying to find a way to get in and sabotage our inheritance and experience with God. 1 Peter 5.8 Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. God is sending you this message today to help you realize that some of the things you may be seeing around your life right now are not just weaknesses or simple sins normalized by the world. Beyond all that, they're tools working like viruses to destroy you and displace you from God's plan for your life. One of the ways the devil destroys God's chosen ones is through pride. We live in one of, if not the, proudest ages in history. People pride themselves in godlessness and in sin. Believers are steadily being deceived into embracing themselves over the Spirit. And this is causing ruin for saints. Very few know the enemy is destroying us with these things. The Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does it mean to resist somebody? It means to cause someone to be unable to do something or reach somewhere. God loves his children dearly. However, when the child of God embraces pride, they take on a characteristic of God's enemy, the devil. This characteristic, like a disease, replaces God in the believer's heart. And where the flesh rules, the works of the flesh will manifest, leading to the gradual destruction of the individual. The Word of God tells us that there are three major elements of the flesh and of sin that birth all the decadence in this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Listen, dear child of God, we are nothing without the help of the Lord. 
Whatever you have today was given to you by God. The life you have is not yours, and one day it'll be required of you. Humility is admitting your need for God. Many people are not saved today, not because they haven't heard of the gospel, but because they're too proud to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In their pride, they're attached to the world and neglect their salvation. Then there's the believer who walks in pride. When a chosen child of God walks in pride, they cannot learn or be corrected. Their own way is the best. Their own decisions are final. Nothing anyone says matters to them. They select what portions of scriptures to obey. They serve God only when convenient. They want the benefits of redemption without the responsibilities. They avoid anyone and anything that might challenge their lifestyle choices. They're easily offended when someone points out something they're not getting right and they find a way to justify their wrong every time. When you notice that you're manifesting these attributes, the enemy has planted pride in your heart and has set you on the path to destruction. The Bible confirms this in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. God wants you to be confident in his ability in you, but not overconfident in yourself in your own might or in your own ability without him. You see, overconfidence in oneself leads to defeat. The Bible says that by strength, no one prevails, and not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's important that you don't lose divine direction because you're too proud to listen and learn. Do not refuse God's help because you're too proud to admit you need him. Sometimes, pride manifests itself to look like humility. But you see, God knows our hearts. He knows what you're doing and the motives behind your actions. And this is the work of the devil. Pride sent the devil out of heaven and is still sending many believers away from a relationship with God. Ask the Lord to purge your heart today and remove every element of pride in yourself. Genuinely let him know that the only thing you want to boast about is him and nothing else. Jeremiah 9, 24. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Secondly, another way the devil destroys God's chosen ones is through secret sins especially lust and sexual sins. Most believers shy away from these issues because they're afraid to confront themselves. Some have been deceived to believe that there is no way out, and this is normal, while many others even settle and enjoy them. However, the Bible tells us that there is forgiveness and deliverance for those who turn away from their evil ways and follow the Lord. It's one thing to profess Christ, and it's another thing to try and walk in the life of Christ. Many believers profess godliness, but live in denial of God's power. They're still under the dominion of sin. And the Bible has said, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because we've died and been resurrected with Christ Jesus. We no longer are slaves to sin, because we've been freed from its power through death in Christ. Romans 6, 6-7 For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. God does not want you to be a slave. This is the whole idea of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to set us free from the power of the devil. Let me make it clear. It is a sin to have a sexual relationship with someone who's not your husband or wife. It's a sin to do so before and after you're married. Apostle Paul encouraged that if you're unmarried and feel strong sexual urges towards your partner, you should marry them so that you do not give room to fornication. When you engage in sexual activity, you unite yourself in spirit with the individual. When this happens, you open yourself up to another spirit besides the Spirit of God. When you begin to invite other spirits into your life, 
you make your body a center for demonic influences and confusion. Yes, a child of God cannot be possessed, but they can be influenced and manipulated by a demonic spirit. This is how addictions and sexual bondages happen. Then it seems like you can't do without engaging in these sins. You may not be possessed. However, you have silenced the Spirit of God because now you have invited numerous other spirits into your life who bring confusion, guilt, and shame. Your body is the temple of the Lord and He wants you to always keep it free from lust and sexual sins. You must remember that your purity matters both here and for eternity. Do not get your spiritual garment stained for a few moments of pleasure, losing even greater things in the process. You must ask the Lord for help, confess that sin to Him, and ask Him to break its yoke from your life. Sexual sin is a very strong weapon in the devil's arsenal. That's why you see that he uses movies, music, the internet, and fashion to come up with more and more ways to suggest and implant sexual ideas. He knows how powerful and effective this is in destroying great destinies, especially those of the children of God. Knowing this, the Bible warns us in Proverbs 4, 23, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, dear child of God. Keep your eyes open. Be careful with what you listen to, what you watch, what you read, and all the information you allow into your space. These things may come to corrupt you or make you a corruption to another believer. Once we become aware of Satan's works, we can overcome them more easily. This is the reason for this video, to show you how the devil destroys God's chosen ones. Do you see any of these in your life? Then you need to turn to the Lord and ask for His help. Ask Him for the grace to guard your heart against every element of pride and sexual sin. Ask Him for the grace to discipline yourself and keep your heart and body under the control of the Holy Spirit. When we ask and trust God to guide our actions as we follow Him, we are sure that we will be found standing in the end. Do you know that one of the most common ways the devil destroys Christians today is through sexual immorality? God's blessing is on healthy sexual activity because it establishes unity in the home, strengthens the bond of love between the couple, and solidifies the foundation of the home where God can be worshipped. However, the enemy has taken this same blessing and turned it into a weapon to destroy the lives of God's chosen people. You see, whenever the child of God has sex or any sexual activity outside the marriage, it is called the sin of fornication, sexual immorality, or adultery. The devil uses these sins as gateways to come into your life and destroy you. We should not be ignorant of his devices, but instead know them and stand against them. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You see, why is this matter very serious? God's word tells us that when we become children of God, we become one with Jesus in spirit. And not only so, we become a part of his body. Hence, whatever you do, it is implied that a part of Christ is doing it. Is that sending a message to you now? No wonder Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said it was unspeakable to take his body, which was now a member or part of Christ's body, and join it in sex with a prostitute. 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! If you will doubt anything in this life, dear saint, please never doubt the word of God as found in the Bible. Everyone may come with their own opinion of the written text and what they think is wrong with it and why their own perspective may be better, but do not fall for it. There is life-giving truth within the pages of the Bible, and it's available to everyone who opens their hearts up to it. 
If you want to see faults, Satan will show you faults. But if you trust the spirit of the word to show you, you will find life in it. I'm saying this because of the current subject of discussion. Many people are going to come to you with one excuse or reason why there is nothing wrong, not just with sexual immorality as long as it is consensual, but with many other things, the Bible warns us against it. You must know that such person, no matter how great he or she is, is not speaking by the Spirit of God. The Bible clearly states in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Before you say this was Paul and not God speaking, we see the same thing in the coming judgment as revealed clearly by God to John on the island of Patmos. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Our message is targeted as two categories of people, those who are sexually active and those who are about to give in to the temptation to engage sexually. If you are married or yet to be married, and you are engaging in sexual intercourse with one who is not your spouse, you are living in sin and on your way to hell if you do not repent and stop it. If you're thinking about it or secretly practicing it through graphic novels or pornography, you are already opening yourself up and setting yourself up for destruction by the enemy. The mystery of sex is that whomever you engage with sexually, you become one with them. This is beyond the physical joining that occurs, but also the spiritual. Biologically, we learn that there is an exchange of bodily fluids during sex. But what most of us do not know is that there is also exchange of spiritual content. People talk about sexually transmitted diseases alone and use that to warn against abstinence. And they are right, but that is only half the truth. You see, you can't blame them because many of them can't explain or understand the spiritual aspect of it. Therefore, the world, as they're prone to, try to go around such instructions to satisfy the flesh by producing and recommending contraceptives and other protections. This may work for some diseases or pregnancy, but there is no contraceptive on earth to protect you from the exchange of spirits during sex. This is why the best thing to do is steer clear off it. This message is specifically for believers because of their position in Christ. The unbeliever has it worse because they are spiritually dead already and sexual immorality is a way of life. They already need Christ whether they are sexually immoral or not. It makes no difference because without Christ in their lives, they are on their way to hell too. However, for the saint, this is different. Satan already rules in the life of the unbeliever, but Christ rules in the life of the saint. In order for Satan to have his way in your life, he introduces things to allow you to open yourself to him. When you fall into these temptations of the devil, he uses that as a means to attack your conscience, your destiny, and some of God's blessings in your life. There is a reason he is called the accuser of the brethren. He is the one that reminds you continually of the sin you have committed and why you are no longer wanted by God or good enough to be saved. His aim is to keep you under, in defeat, until you stop following Christ and He becomes your Lord instead. How many Christians have turned from God today, not because of the sins they committed alone, but because of the attacks the enemy made on their consciences through the loopholes those sins created. You must be careful, dear saint. If you have been living in sexual sin before now, don't let another moment pass before you stop it. 
consider this as God's sign to do so. Or maybe you have been involved and are trusting God to stop it because you don't know how. Make sure you pay attention till the end as well. This is also a message for you. We have prayerfully put this material together, trusting God to help everyone who listens experience God's saving power to break free from sexual immorality. Sexual sins are destructive weapons the enemy uses against Christians because he knows that when a believer gives his or her body over to a partner who they are not married to, they pollute their bodies. Why is this a serious sin? You see, apart from our bodies being a part of Christ's body, which is supposed to be holy and pure, when we become born again, our bodies become God's dwelling place through His Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19-20 Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You no longer own yourself, my friend. God bought you already. With what? With the blood of his son, Jesus. When Jesus was dying on that cross, he was doing so, giving his life in exchange for you. Why? Because God loves you that much. The only thing he asks of you now is to live for him. He died for you, and now he wants you to live for him. He wants you to allow his life find expression through you. Now, through the Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead lives inside you. A temple is called a sacred place simply because it is dedicated to a deity. This is the same for all religions. Whether it is built with wood, clay or iron, it is an ordinary building until it is dedicated to a deity. The moment it is consecrated to any deity, that place becomes holy and is guided by different laws that honor that deity. Whatever you do contrary to those laws will be considered blasphemy against that deity and a desecration of its temple. This is the same with our bodies now. You see, in the Old Testament, God promised that one day he would no longer fill the temple built by the hands of anyone, but that he would begin to live in the hearts of humans. That prophecy has come to pass in our days. Now God lives in you and in anyone who has surrendered their hearts to Jesus Christ. And from that moment onwards, your body is his temple. You may not know this, but you are a walking temple. However, the question is, who occupies your temple now? Have you desecrated your temple so much that there are demons all around it? Or have you opened its doors so that demons have gained access and filled it with all sorts of darkness? Your body is God's temple, my friend. When you give it to sexual immorality, you are harming and polluting it, allowing demons in. And when demons have a foothold in your life, they will oppress you destroying and corrupting whatever their hands can lay hold on. Do not give the enemy this room in your life. Don't keep letting him oppress you more than he is already doing. I'm not saying that it is easy to live pure and holy, not especially in the world that not only approves of it, but also promotes it massively. No matter the sector of industry, there is a degree of sexual engagement being promoted. We see them in movies, music, literature, fashion, media, internet, and everywhere else. Do you not know that no one is exempted now? Like while growing up, there were things we weren't allowed to watch and the censorship was decent until recent years. Now, even kids' shows have a certain degree or hints of sexual activities discreetly chipped in. Only sensitive people are able to notice it and caution their kids and loved ones from watching them. Think of how much sexual education teenagers are getting now. More of these are geared towards their engagement than ever their abstinence. They are presented with the false idea that sex is how you show love, receive love, or prove you are in the trend. 
So we have many young people who grew up wanting to feel loved and accepted, but only getting used and damaged. We are seeing a continuous increase in adults with emotional, psychological, and even health issues, which grew up with them from their teenage, struggling to become better versions of themselves to no avail. These things have affected their views about life, about themselves, and in most cases, about God. The Bible is full of different characters who partook of sexual sins and faced the repercussions. Yes, there will always be repercussions. Many homes got broken. Some people are exposed to demonic oppression and some even possession. Some people engage and are emotionally broken in such a way that only God's grace can heal them and change their views on life. Some others get infected with one disease or the others, which in some cases might cost them their lives. The issues can include much more than this physically and spiritually. Reuben brought a curse upon himself and his generations after him for a long time because he slept with one of his father's wives. Samson lost his anointing and cut short his life because of his involvement with an ungodly woman. Amnon's life was cut short for sleeping with his half-sister, Tamar. David slept with Bathsheba, killing her husband Uriah to cover it up. She got pregnant, but the baby died, and David was punished later as his own son, Absalom, would stir up a coup against his own father, chasing him away from the country, and publicly sleep with all his father's concubines in public, all in one day. There is nothing good to gain from engaging in sexual immorality. Yes, you may get a few moments of pleasure, but what do you do about the things that were exchanged after all the pleasure evaporates? How do you deal with the guilt, knowing that you have sinned? How do you live with the fact that you have dishonored God's temple and cannot enter heaven this way? My friend, it's time to say no more to the devil. To take a stand and turn back to God so that the enemy does not deceive you until you find yourself where you never imagined you'd be. If you want to deal with this sin, which the enemy is using to destroy believers, here are a few helpful ways. 1. Acknowledge that you are in sin and then turn to God in repentance. You can lie to everyone else, but the greatest harm you can do to yourself is lie to yourself. You can never lie to God because He knows you more than you know yourself. So if you are serious about breaking out of the snare of sexual sin, you must first be honest about it to yourself. Admit that you are in sin and disobedience and then turn to God. It is not the time to run from God or from church. Run to God. He wants you because He is the only one who can fix you. The Bible says He is faithful and just to forgive all who come to Him confessing their sins and trusting Him to help them overcome it. As you come to God, ask Him to set you free from that spirit of sexual immorality and purge your life of every deposit from your past. 2. Start feeding yourself with the truth in God's Word. Our lives are defined by whatever we believe about ourselves. If you listen long enough that you are a sexual animal who can do nothing about your urges, you will soon believe that is who you are. However, the Bible already says that you are a new creature and you are no longer a slave of sin. Therefore, sin shall no longer rule over you as it did when you weren't saved. This kind of discovery empowers you to learn how to accept who you are and stand against anything that wants to change that. The more you feed on and speak God's word over yourself, you purge off the old and take on the new identity with new ability to resist the devil while standing in what God says. 3. Disengage and avoid triggers. Triggers are things that takes your mind back to your sin, not to make you guilty but to tempt you again. This is where the real battle is. Therefore, in order to break free, avoid things, shows, friends, books, music, 
or anything that will trigger sexual urges while you are in your recovery process. The more you starve the lust, the thinner it gets until it dies. This is not and never will be an overnight thing, but through consistency in God's grace, you can get there. Joseph did not stay close to Potiphar's wife because he knew her plans, so he fled from her. You are not to condone sexual sin around you. In fact, it is the only sin you are asked to run from in the Bible. 4. Commit to a prayer life. There is a direct link between prayer and sanctification. The more prayerful you are, both privately and corporately with other believers, the more inclined and empowered you will be for holiness and freedom from sexual sins. These truths are helpful and will do you good if you commit to it. I encourage you to be sincere with God and intentional about being free. That is the only way it will turn out so for you. It is my prayer that God's power will break you free from Satan's bondage, giving you an escape from the trap of destruction. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever found yourself in the midst of a battle, feeling overwhelmed and uncertain of the outcome? It's in those moments that our greatest weapon emerges, worship. Yes, worship has the power to make the enemy flee faster than anything else. When we lift up praise and gratitude to heaven, even in the midst of our hardest trials, chains are broken and victory is birthed. Let me share with you a story of two men named Paul and Silas. They found themselves in a dark and gloomy prison cell for preaching the gospel. Now, most people would complain and despair in such a situation, but not Paul and Silas. They understood the power of worship. So instead of wallowing in self-pity, they chose to praise God. They lifted their voices in songs of adoration and gratitude, filling that prison cell with the sweet fragrance of worship. And guess what happened? Chains were broken and their prison door swung wide open. Their worship became a catalyst for miracles. When we choose to worship God in the midst of our battles, something supernatural takes place. God takes notice and He moves on our behalf. He fights our battles and turns them into blessings. I know it's not always easy to worship when the storms of life are raging around us. But remember the story of Jehoshaphat. When faced with rumors of war and a vast army that threatened to overwhelm him, he didn't rely on his own strategies and plans. Instead, he turned to Jehovah Nisi, the God of victory. He understood that his battles were not his alone to fight. So if you find yourself in the midst of a battle today, I encourage you to follow in the footsteps of Jehoshaphat. Seek God's face and worship him with all your heart. Don't wait for the victory to come before you praise him. Praise him now in the midst of the storm. As you do, watch how God moves on your behalf. You may be wondering, but how does worship turn battles into blessings? Well, when we worship, our focus shifts from the magnitude of our problems to the greatness of our God. We declare His sovereignty over our circumstances. We remind ourselves that He is faithful and that He has the power to turn our battles into blessings. And here's the beautiful truth. God is not limited by the size of your battle. Just as Jehoshaphat and his men found an abundance of plunder after their victory, God can turn your battles into blessings that overflow, but it starts with your willingness to worship Him, to surrender your battles into His capable hands. So I encourage you today to lift up your voice in worship. Let your praise be a weapon that scatters the enemy and invites the presence of God into your situation. Trust that He is working behind the scenes, aligning everything for your good. Your battles may be fierce, but God is greater. And he will take those battles and turn them into blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Remember, you are not alone in this journey. God is with you every step of the way. So worship him with all your heart and watch as he transforms your battles into blessings. In the depths of my despair, I never imagined that I would emerge stronger. Life had dealt me blow after blow and I thought I had reached my breaking point, but little did I know God was molding my spirit preparing me for the battles that lay ahead. You see, it's not the battles themselves that concern God. It's the person we become in the midst of the fight. 
He wants us to grasp the truth that we are already victorious, fighting from a position of triumph. It's awe-inspiring to hear the stories of those who have conquered adversity. Their words echo through time, reminding us that someone has walked the path we're currently treading. And if they emerge victorious, then so can we. There's an indescribable comfort in knowing that our struggles today will become the source of strength for someone else's tomorrow. Your battles, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are not in vain. They are a testimony in the making, a powerful narrative of transformation waiting to unfold. Believe with all your heart that your battles will be transformed into blessings. Your victory is not a mere possibility. It is secure in the loving embrace of Christ Jesus. He is the refuge where you can find solace amidst life's relentless storms. Lean on Him, for He is the helper of the helpless, the defender of the weak. Trust that He will fight on your behalf. I may not fully comprehend the magnitude of your pain, the weight of your burdens, or the extent of your fears. The shadows of doubt and anxiety may have cast their darkness upon your soul, making it difficult to envision a way out. But hear God's gentle whisper, Fear not for I am with you. In the stillness of your heart, surrender your battles to Him. Letting God fight your battles is not a sign of weakness, but rather an act of profound faith. It requires acknowledging that you cannot do it alone, that your strength alone is insufficient. But in surrendering, you open the door for divine intervention. You allow the Almighty to showcase His power and grace in your life. And when the time comes for you to testify, oh, what a testimony it will be. So, as you stand on the precipice of your battles, take heart. You are being sculpted into a warrior, fortified by the trials you face. Trust that God will transform your battles into blessings beyond measure. Your story, your struggle, and your ultimate triumph will touch the lives of many. Embrace the journey, for the victory is already yours. In the depths of his despair, Jehoshaphat sought the wisdom of the Lord humbly acknowledging his own limitations in the face of an overwhelming battle. He understood that victory could not be won by his own strength alone. Little did he know that his surrender would pave the way for God's incredible promise to unfold. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. As the battle raged on, Jehoshaphat and his people chose to worship the Lord instead of succumbing to fear. They positioned themselves in complete trust while God maneuvered amongst their enemies, causing confusion and chaos among their ranks. In the end, the enemies destroyed themselves, leaving not a single one standing. But the story doesn't end there. After the battle, Jehoshaphat and his people spent three days collecting the spoils of victory. They experience the unexpected blessings that come when we lay down our battles before God and choose to worship Him in the midst of adversity. And these blessings, once received, continue to flow into our lives, filling our days with abundance and peace. Such is the nature of God's grace and favor, overflowing and never-ending. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15-17. through 17. And when the servants of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In our own lives, we often face battles that leave us feeling defenseless and weary. But fret not, for we have been equipped with the armor of God, a divine arsenal of protection and strength. Yet it is not enough to merely adorn ourselves with the spiritual armor. We must also wield the most potent weapon of all, the sword of the Spirit, which is the living, breathing Word of God. He himself is the Word, and his Word is a double-edged sword, carrying immeasurable power within our grasp. When we fully grasp this truth, what is there left to fear? If the Almighty God is on our side, who can stand against us? In the book of Psalm, chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. 
I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. Sadly, we often find ourselves resembling the ancient Israelites, entering battles unarmed and ill-prepared. We forget the incredible weapon we possess in God's word. We underestimate the authority and dominion bestowed upon us as his children, but no more. It's time to rise up and take hold of the sword of the Spirit, using it to overcome every trial and tribulation that comes our way. Know this, sometimes God will encase you in a protective shield, shielding you from every attack. Other times he will go before you, striking down the very things that rise against you. Imagine the power of a God who confronts your enemies head on, engaging in battle on your behalf. This is the reality of the God we serve. So my dear brothers and sisters, remember this truth, God will take your battles, the ones that threaten to overwhelm and consume you and transform them into blessings beyond your wildest dreams. Surrender your fears and doubts, lay down your weapons of self-reliance and trust in the Lord with all your heart. In the midst of the storm, lift your voice in worship and watch as God orchestrates victory on your behalf. May his blessings overflow in your life and may you walk in the abundant peace that only he can provide. In the vast arena of life, battles will inevitably come your way. Some battles may require you to fight, while others demand you to stand firm and trust in the Almighty. The question is, do you truly believe in the power of God to turn these battles into blessings, or do you merely skim through the pages of Scripture without embracing the life-transforming truth they hold? The Lord is not interested in your knowledge alone. He longs for your unwavering faith in His ability to work wonders in your life. When it comes to spiritual warfare, it is not your strength that prevails, but rather the power of God flowing through you. You are a conduit for His victory to manifest, for the battle was never truly yours to begin with. God, in His infinite wisdom, is capable of taking you from a state of derision to one of sheer delight. These words are not merely empty promises. They are His divine assurance to you. When you grasp the magnitude of what God can accomplish on your behalf, it strengthens the very fiber of your faith. Just like Job who found himself in the midst of turmoil, you too can remain unshaken in your trust in God. Even when circumstances seem dire and all hope appears lost, hold fast to your belief that God will deliver you from the depths of despair. In a twist of fate, Joseph was unjustly accused and thrown into prison. But even within the confines of those cold walls, God's favor shone upon him. Through divine intervention, Joseph rose from the depths of imprisonment to become a prime minister, a man of influence. It is a testament to the fact that God is not limited by our circumstances. He is the master of turning our setbacks into comebacks. Perhaps you find yourself in a similar predicament, feeling betrayed, forsaken, or wrongly accused. Take heart, for God is capable of fighting for you. He sees the battles you face, both seen and unseen, and he longs to turn them into blessings beyond your wildest imagination. Even in the realm of your workplace, where challenges may abound, remember this, whatever it is, it's in your favor. Believe in God's miraculous intervention and watch as your blessings astound those around you. In the midst of life's storms, learn the art of being still. Though the winds may rage and the waves may crash, find solace in the knowledge that God is in control. So my friend, let go of the anxiety that weighs you down. Release the burden of overthinking how to solve every problem. Instead, find peace in the truth that God is sovereign and He has a perfect plan for your life. Trust in His unwavering love and watch as He transforms your battles into blessings. Remember the words of Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Embrace the stillness, let go of your striving and allow God to work miracles in your life. He is faithful and he will take your battles and turn them into blessings beyond your wildest dreams. In a world filled with many voices and many spirits who want to commune with you, you have to listen when God's Spirit speaks to your heart. One of your greatest assets as a Christian is the Holy Spirit. He's the means through whom God the Father communicates with you in your spirit, either directly through the Word or through other means. Sometimes the Lord may be speaking to you, but because you don't understand or know how to listen, you may think He's silent. The Bible says there are many kinds of languages in this world, and each one has meaning. Not one is useless. 
It's also necessary to say that even in our relationship with God, every word from God has a meaning, an instruction, a promise, and an intention from God to us. If we miss the meaning or main message when God speaks to our hearts, we miss everything He aims to work in our lives. I say this to all believers. One of the main reasons we wander and struggle is because we hardly let God lead us. And one of the most common ways God leads us, His children, is by speaking directly to our hearts. How does God do this? He speaks to our spirits through His own Spirit living within us. You see, if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside you. God does not need to come down to communicate with you. He now lives inside you through His Spirit. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit with His disciples in John 16, 12 to 15. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me, because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is Mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from Me what He will make known to you. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord brings light into what the Bible says. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord will give you instruction regarding your decisions and how you ought to go about them. Let me walk you through this a little to be sure you know how the Lord will convey His words to you. You see, like I said earlier, God speaks to His children through many ways. God can use different means to communicate with you than He does with another person. Some people may testify how God speaks to them through dreams or visions. Another person may say he speaks to them through an audible voice, as if someone's with them in the same room. Another may come and say they just sense a witness within their spirits over something. They can tell that it's God speaking to them about something. Whichever way God uses, one thing is clear. Regardless of how God speaks to each one of us, we must know how to identify and pay attention when He speaks. And one of the identifying marks of a believer who's intimate with God is your ability to know when He speaks to you by spirit. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. When you're close to someone, you can easily identify their voice no matter where you are. I remember the first time I was meeting a close friend of mine whom I'd met online. We'd known each other for years and shared great moments. However, we'd never met each other face to face, except through video calls and photographs. Yet it felt like we'd known each other for ages. That day, I arrived in the city late at night because of traffic jams and he had to come pick me up from my cab stop. When I saw him coming from a distance in the darkness, I could tell he was the one. Even though I hadn't seen his face in the light yet, all I could see was the silhouette of his image, and that was enough. That is the true power of intimacy. If you're close to someone, you can recognize their voice and presence, even if you can't see them. Do you know that you can get that intimate with God? In fact, do you know that God wants you to be that intimate with Him? He wants you to know His presence and identify His voice. He wants you to know how to differentiate between the voices of the world, the voice of the devil, and the voice of His Spirit in your heart. You may not know this, but the devil also tries to speak to your heart just like God does. And this is exactly why you must listen and know to obey God when God's Spirit is speaking to your heart. If you can't, you'll fall into many troubles. Jesus said in John 10, 3-5, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. In these verses, Jesus was confirming that there will be voices of strangers who try to communicate with you. But if you're his follower, you won't pay attention to those voices.
but rather run away from them. When God's Spirit speaks to you, He communicates with your heart. He doesn't speak to your physical ears. I believe that one reason most believers struggle to hear God is because we want to hear Him with our physical ears. And that's not how God communicates. You see, the Bible says that God is a spirit and must be worshipped as one. As a spirit, He communicates with His children through their own spirits. When the Spirit of God is communicating with you, He uses the voice of your consciousness. Sometimes this may sound like you're the one thinking to yourself, but the truth is that God's Spirit is speaking to your heart. Now, the devil can do this too, but there are ways to tell if it's God's Spirit speaking to your heart or the devil. Number one, when God's Spirit speaks to your heart, His words don't contradict what the Bible says. This is the first and most important measure of God's Word. Remember that when the devil tempted Jesus, he quoted verses from the scriptures. How did Jesus recognize and counter the deception? He revealed that Satan was taking those verses out of context. You see, not every word taken from the Bible and echoing in your heart is from God's Spirit. You need to be able to connect the words being said with the character and power of God. The enemy or your flesh will not give your heart inspirations that agree with the character of God. For example, when you hear a voice telling you to avenge yourself of a hurt, that's not from God's Spirit. Why? Because it doesn't agree with the character of God from the Bible that says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The voice that tells you not to apologize when you're at fault is not from God's Spirit either, even if it backs you up with verses from the Bible. Why? because it doesn't align with the character of the Holy Spirit, which is love, sacrifice, and humility. This is why you need to get close to your Bible. The more you understand God's Word, the more you'll know about His character, as the Bible tells us a lot about God and how He operates. Develop your Bible reading and prayer habit. The success of your journey with God depends on it. Number two. When God's Spirit speaks to your heart, His words come with peace and not anxiety. Another very important way to know God's voice is whenever He speaks to your heart, you'll sense His peace as well. God's Word doesn't lead you to confusion or panic. Instead, like a gentle wind, it blows away anxiety and gives you clarity and comfort no matter the situation involved. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 85, 8, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. What God may be instructing you to do may seem difficult or even impossible to the human mind. Yet in your heart, you'll have an assurance of peace. The Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding. So, how do you listen to God's Spirit when He speaks to your heart? 1. Silence the outside noise. The world is full of many voices, so in order for you to create an atmosphere around yourself where you can easily listen to God's voice, you need to learn to shut out the noise. How do you do this? Give attention to the things that add more value to your spiritual life. Instead of paying attention to the carnal things, the more you feed your spirit, the stronger it gets. And the stronger your spiritual sensitivity becomes, the more your heart can hear God without confusion or mix-ups with other voices. You can also silence the noise by speaking the Word of God out loud over yourself habitually. Make it a habit to always speak God's Word and promises over yourself. You're more likely to hear God speak to your heart through the words you've been speaking over yourself just like the devil uses the negativity in your mind to speak to you too. 2. Spend time in prayer, especially time praying in tongues. The more time you spend praying in tongues, the more you subdue your mind. When you pray in tongues, your mind isn't participating, but your spirit is. At that time, God can speak to you and you'll hear. This is one of the reasons the devil is constantly trying to influence your prayer life negatively. Prayer is not just dashing in and dashing out. It's communicating with God, talking to and listening to God speak. 
During prayer, you can become silent in meditation, especially when you're fasting. Most times, we underestimate the power of fasting. We think we should only fast when we have a big problem or need power. But the truth is that fasting is meant to help you hear what God's saying and give your spirit more strength over the flesh. If you're going to succeed in your Christian journey and in life as a whole, dear saint, then you need to take these words to heart. You have to start listening so that when God's Spirit speaks to your heart, you'll hear and you'll obey. Have you ever felt like you are stuck in a valley of dry bones? Like your dreams, relationships, and plans are all dried up and abandoned? Let me tell you that God is testing you because He's preparing you for something better. You see, God has a plan for each and every one of us. He has written a destiny over our lives and put dreams in our hearts. But the path to fulfillment of that dream is never easy. It's filled with thorns and thickets, storms and lions. And that's because God intends on refining us and preparing us for our place of promise. We often assume that by serving God in ministry, we are entitled to ease. But the truth is, nothing worth having ever comes easy or without opposition. And that's why God allows the path to be difficult. He wants to extract from us that which our enemy would love to leverage against us. But here's the good news. God loves us too much to promote us before we're ready. He knows exactly what we need in order to fulfill our destiny, and He is preparing us for it. And when that time comes, He will promote us to the place of promise that He has for us. You know, I've always wanted my life to glorify God. I want to live a life that shows God infinite power and worth so that He gets all the praise, not me. And maybe you feel the same way. But here's the thing. When God uses people to show His power, He uses trials, not comfort. You see, trials are God's most used tool. And that's because trials refine us and prepare us for the place of promise that God has for us. So if you're going through a rough patch, don't lose heart. God is preparing you for something better. Trust in Him and keep moving forward. You're closer to your place of promise than you think. God is testing you because He's preparing you for something better. Think about it. God has a history of using people who have faced major trials. Remember the stories from the Bible of people like Job, Joseph, Daniel, Moses, and Paul. They all faced incredible trials, yet they were used by God in amazing ways. In fact, we remember them because of how they faced their trials. Had they never faced a major trial, we probably wouldn't know their names. So if you desire to be used by God for His glory, then you must be prepared for trials. God entrusts us with trials, and sometimes lots of them. But here's the thing. God never says, oops, or my bad. He's always in control of the trials. Even if we can't see how, we can be confident that God is working for His glory. Now, I know that pain can be overwhelming, but remember, pain is not without purpose. As Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among all nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And Romans 8.28 tells us that, For those who love God, all things work together for good. So, if you are gaining a greater willingness to serve God and love Him regardless of whether He gives you what you've been asking for, then this is a good sign that He is preparing you to receive it. Trust Him and keep pushing forward. Remember, God is not on His throne wringing His hands as He waits for the outcome of events. He's in control, and He promises to work for His glory and our eternal good. So let's stop worrying about how things are going to work out and trust that God has a plan for our lives. As we face trials and tribulations, let's be like the heroes of the faith who have gone before us. 
let's stand strong, knowing that God is preparing us for something better. And when the storm passes, we will emerge stronger and more ready to serve God than ever before. So take heart and keep faith. God is with you every step of the way, and He will never leave you or forsake you. Trust in Him, and He will make a way where there seems to be no way. It's easy to get caught up in wanting something so badly that we forget to consider if it's really in line with God's plan for our lives. James 4.3 tells us that sometimes our desires are misguided, and we need to be mindful of that. It's possible that the blessing you're seeking isn't in God's will for you at this moment. But let me ask you this. Are you willing to trust God even when He says no to your prayer request? Can you love and serve Him even if you don't receive the blessing you're seeking? That is the true test of your faith and your relationship with Him. In Mark 7, 26-30, we see an example of a woman who was seeking a blessing from her daughter. Jesus initially seemed to rebuff her request, but she persisted and showed that her heart was truly in the right place. She was seeking the blessing for the glory of God, not just for her own selfish desires. So if you're feeling like God is testing you and withholding blessings, take heart. It's possible that He's preparing you for something even better than what you've been asking for. Trust in Him and seek His will above your own desires. Remember, He knows what's best for us, even when we don't understand it in the moment. Let us keep our faith strong and our hearts focused on God's plan for us. He loves us and wants the best for us, even if it means testing us along the way. Let's embrace the journey and trust His guidance, knowing that He is preparing us for something greater than we could ever imagine. I want to encourage you today that just like Jesus said no to the woman in the Bible, sometimes God says no to us so that we can grow in our faith and be prepared for something better. God wants to bless us, but He also wants us to have the faith to receive those blessings. Sometimes that means going through a period of testing, where we have to trust God even when it seems like He's not answering our prayers. It's in those moments when our true character is revealed. Will we run from God or will we continue to trust Him even when we don't get what we want? God is not trying to withhold blessings from us, but He wants us to be prepared to receive them. But here's the good news. Just because God says no at first doesn't mean He won't eventually say yes. If we respond to His no with faith and trust, He can use that to prepare us for something even better than what we originally asked for. Sometimes we have to go through a valley of decision where our dreams and desires are tested, but it's in those valleys that we can grow in our faith and become the people God wants us to be. So if you're feeling discouraged today because it seems like God is not answering your prayers, I want to encourage you to keep trusting Him. Use this time to grow your faith and become the person God wants you to be. And remember, God's no is often just a stepping stone to His yes. In Ephesians 3.20, we are reminded that God wants to do abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or think. But here's the clincher. It's according to His work within us. That means the more we allow God to work in us, the more He will do great things through us. So when we're going through a season of refining, we need to lean in and trust the loving hand of our precious Savior. Think about those dry bones in the valley. They represent the marriages, relationships, and dreams that many people have abandoned because they refuse to die to themselves, to humble themselves, and to let God have His way in their lives. But we don't have to let our dreams die in the valley. Instead, we need to humble ourselves and seek to understand what the Lord is doing around us. Yes, it is hard. It's not easy to go through seasons of refining. But remember, on the other side of this refining time is a fresh perspective and new mercies. So let's refuse a sense of entitlement 
and not demand to be understood. Instead, let's trust in God's plan and purpose for our lives. He will faithfully lead us and we will be strengthened as we go. So let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. In due time, we will be lifted up and honored before a watching world. God uses trials to turn our dependence fully on Him. He wants us to cling to Him and find peace in Him alone. And remember, He is preparing us for something better, something abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or think. So if you are in a season of refining, hold on tight to your faith. Trust in the Lord and know that He is working all things together for your good. Don't let your dreams die in the valley. Instead, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and let Him lead you to the other side. Remember, He wants to do great things through you, but it starts with His work within you. So let's surrender to Him and watch as He does abundantly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or think. Trials and weaknesses may be tough to face, but they are actually God's way of preparing us for something greater. When we go through those tough times, we learn to rely on Him and not ourselves. We learn to recognize that it is God alone who deserves recognition and honor. We learn that He is our source of strength and not our own abilities. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 28-29, it says that God chooses what is low and despised in the world to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And you know what? That includes our trials and weaknesses. God entrusts us with those challenges as a gift because He knows that they will ultimately bring us closer to Him. So when trials come your way, remember that they are not meant to break you, but shape you. They are meant to help you grow in your faith and holiness. And when you respond to those trials with faith and holiness, you can have joy in the fact that you are storing up rewards in heaven. But if you respond with fear and complaining, you miss out on that opportunity for reward. Remember, God is testing you because He is preparing you for something better. So don't give up when things get tough. Instead, lean into God and trust that He is with you every step of the way. He has great plans for you, and He will never leave you nor forsake you.